Well, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this webcast to reveal and discuss the results of the fifth annual Future of Cloud Computing Survey conducted by Northbridge with uh, the cooperation of Wikibon and some 50 uh, other partners. This is the longest running and uh, arguably the most ambitious survey of its kind. Been looking at cloud as it has developed from a cottage industry really back five years ago to now a, a mega trend that is dominating the, the business landscape uh, and indeed is transforming the way we do IT. Uh, because this survey has been conducted over the last five years, we have the privilege of being able to look at changes over that time. And I think you'll find in our discussion today that some of the changes we have seen in attitudes, in businesses that are adopting the cloud, in the way they're adopting the cloud, and in the way organizations are shifting to accommodate the cloud, have changed rather dramatically in really a, a very short period of time. So uh, joining me today on this panel are two experts uh, one on the investment side and one on the cloud adoption and the technology side. Let's first meet Jim Moran, who is a general partner with Northbridge. Northbridge is a venture capital firm. He's been uh, with Northbridge since 2009, and he currently sits on the boards of WP Engine, eRecruit, and Confer. Now, Jim has extensive business experience. He was also on the board of uh, Padient, which was acquired by PayPal this year. Prior to Northbridge, he was chief executive officer of Convergence Net Networks, and he was also a co-founder of eDocs, which became the leading service provider of web self-service and online billing and payment solutions to the Fortune 500. And Jim has led the, uh, really been the, the point person on this survey from the Northbridge perspective, pulling together an extensive partner network to uh, cover 952 respondents across 38 countries. So this survey is not only very large in scope, it's very large in geographic uh, diversity as well. You're going to hear what's happening around the world uh, as well as around many different industries. Uh, joining us also on the panel today is Brian Gracely. Brian is a Wikibon senior analyst. He brings over 20 years of experience to the Wikibon community from leadership, product stra marketing, strategy, marketing, and technical marketing roles, where he was at Cisco, Linksys, NetApp, Virtustream, and EMC. Now, uh, Brian has delivered both commercial products and solutions uh, in the open source realm to global markets, uh, as well as to uh, commercial local markets. He's active in many technical communities. A uh, very uh, skilled technologist in the area of cloud, and someone I'd like to turn to first, uh, Brian, to uh, sort of go over the high points and the agenda for what we're going <coughs> to talk about during the next hour. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Paul, thanks for the introduction, and, and Great panel today. Uh, really excited that, that the great thing about what we're doing today is not only uh, is Wikibon working really, really closely with, with Northbridge. Northbridge has done a tremendous job pulling together all of this data, uh, working with 50 plus uh, industry partners about this, but we're doing this uh, using a ton of cloud technologies. We want you, the audience, to be involved with this. So not only are we going to do this webinar live uh, for the next hour or so, uh, you can follow crowdchat.net slash future of cloud. So you want to interact with us, that's going to be going on for a couple of hours. Uh, if you want to just follow on Twitter slash future of cloud. Uh, so we're going to talk a lot about the trends, we're going to talk about the data, and, and we've got an awesome panel because we've got Jim, ton of VC background, you know, you know where the investments are going, uh, my background's in technology, Paul's going to give us a high level. So really excited about, the, uh, about what's going on here. Um, why don't, you, why don't you jump in real quick? Just yeah, sure. Because you, you, this is your baby. You've had it for four or five years. We, we have had it, and thank you, Paul, and thank you, Brian. It is a, a great, uh, it's, it's been a big team effort here, and uh, we're happy to sort of unveil some of these results here. Um, and as you said, uh, this whole survey is, uh, we're eating the dog food, is certainly powered in the cloud. Um, so I, this is our fifth year, and it's the most exten extensive survey of, uh, of all things happening related to the cloud. And as you said, we've had over 51 companies uh, uh, involved in this and over 1,000 respondents, I think in 38 countries, if I have it correct. And, um, and calling out you know, a few of our platinum collaborators here, folks like Acquia and Red Hat, CenturyLink, WP Engine, uh, to name a few. So uh, we've got a lot to talk about here. And uh, uh, we're excited to sort of start to reveal some of the some of the trends and the detail associated with these results. Right, right. And uh, following up on what Brian said about the CrowdChat, I want to remind you that if you go to crowdchat.net slash future of cloud, you can follow along with the discussion that uh, accompanies this presentation. And if there are topics that you would like us to address on this panel, introduce them in the uh, CrowdChat. And uh, we are monitoring the CrowdChat actively and we'll, uh, we'll try to get to your questions 
live in the discussion. Uh, Brian, let's move on, uh, start with, the, with hybrid, public, private cloud. Certainly, mm -hmm. uh, debate has been going on in the industry for some time over where the real growth is, where the action is, and I think this survey provides some clarity to that. Would you say so? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, one of, the, one of the biggest questions that we always get about, about cloud computing is, um, is this a winner-take-all game? Uh, how fast are things going to move from traditional IT, which tends to live in the data center behind the firewall, uh, into the public cloud? Uh, you know, well, how does that impact today's traditional vendors? How does it impact the, the startups and the, the public cloud providers? Uh, so let's dig into the data a little bit. Let's give folks some numbers here. So uh, right now what we're seeing from the thousand or so uh, respondents is you know, the usage of public cloud, private cloud, and hybrid cloud breaks down like this. It's about uh, a third in the public cloud, uh, about two thirds in what people are, and this is survey results, uh, private or hybrid. And you know, that aligns very well, not only with the survey respondents that we've seen, but with the Wikibon forecast, we're forecasting that we think uh, we'll see in terms of spend for IT over the next 10 years, uh, about a third of that will be in the public cloud, two thirds of that will remain in some sort of private or hybrid environment. Now, the interesting data point that came out of this for us was, <clears throat> you know, we've all seen how fast public cloud's growing. Uh, companies like Amazon have now been releasing their numbers so we get a better sense from a transparency perspective. Uh, but what's really changed is, as we look at this from 2011, um, the mode of what people are thinking about in terms of private, which is, you know, in your data center, you're more comfortable with it, it's got all the security and compliance pieces there, uh, about 40, 48%, almost 50% of people are saying that's, that's coming way down on their priority list uh, and they're looking much more towards a hybrid environment. Now, what hybrid means to different people, lots of different definitions out there. Uh, Stu Miniman and I did a video about this yesterday. Uh, but what it really, the way to think about it is, people are realizing they've got to take advantage of a combination of both private, uh, public resources which give them scalability, which allow them to be more agile, but they've also got aspects of their business that need to be uh, you know, compliant, uh, they still maybe have some concerns about security, but they're, they're much more active in terms of how do I blend those two things together. How do you see it from, a, from an investment perspective? We were talking earlier, you've got companies that you're investing in, maybe start in, in public, but, but have to deal with use cases that, that spread across that. Well, right, well, you know, if, if we actually go to the next slide, it actually, some of that answer will be in there, for mm -hmm. instance, as we reveal here. So 77% so of all organizations uh, have SaaS offerings today yep. and have information as a service offerings, which is a 9% increase over 2014. So I would tell you that um, the investment dollars in the venture <coughs> capital and growth equity community are being directed at organizations that are deploying SaaS, innovative SaaS, SaaS solutions for the enterprise. And examples of that today would be, you know, there are firms like Splunk, uh, analytics uh, platforms like um, uh, Tableau, and uh, you, know, you, you look at other uh, platforms like NetSuite or Intuit, and the consumers now are being trained to work with these mobile apps that are very intuitive, easy to download, easy to work with. And so in the enterprise, those same buyers of enterprise solutions are saying, why can't I have simple, easy to use solutions that business analysts and folks who are running businesses can dream up, deliver, and deploy as a service to their constituents. And today, that's, that's really, you know, we're seeing evidence of that today when you say 77% of, of companies today have SaaS offerings. Right. Or, and one last point is information as a service. Well, subscription services today. If you're a subscriber to the New York Times or you're a subscriber to another content management solution, those are being delivered in the cloud. And, and those kinds of, uh, of solutions are, you know, um, more and more accessible uh, you know, Dow Jones is a business, business to business offering in the cloud. Right. And right. what we're seeing, uh, Jim, I, I think also is, is some shifts in the way uh, services are delivered, the way they're sold, the way customers expect to, uh, expect to access them. We're seeing freemium models emerge, uh, free trials, uh, uh, community additions, uh, and, and really in, in some cases a, a, a displacement of the, of the channel. Uh, and one of the interesting findings of this survey I think was that I, I believe about 70% of your respondents said that they prefer to, to deal directly with the service provider rather than going through a channel partner. Is that a seismic shift? Well, well yes, and so you, you, you raise uh, two or three very important uh, things there. So first of all, um, today uh, it's not apparent but when uh, enterprises buy today, they buy very differently from the way that they bought 10 or 15 years ago. So 15 years ago when Oracle was selling its financials, it was a boots on the street, 
high friction, in person, lots of meetings, dinners, lunches, you know, um, on-site sort of selling. Today, enterprises do not buy like that. They buy, it's a sort of self-discovery process. They go online, they learn about the solutions that are available. They can do this today um, much more effectively and productively. They know what their needs are and their business requirements. Then they go online and they discover what is available to them, mapping to their own critical business issues. And then they raise their hand and say, I'm ready to try something, which brings up the freemium model. Maybe they try... Uh, Splunk has made that freemium model very successful where you could use their solution up to a certain point and then if you wanted to use it further you would then <coughs> you would then pay so it's sort of try before you buy another theme is organizations today don't want to spend uh, they want to match their needs with capacity so I only buy the the cloud is elastic so today if I'm a subscriber of salesforce.com for instance I only buy what I need when I need it. If I need more, I can cycle up. If I need less, I can bring it back down. And again, that elasticity in the cloud, matching my needs and the demands of my business with, uh, with technology is another big change in business model as yeah. well. It certainly uh, it increases transparency as well yes. because as a vendor, you can't sell technology you don't have. You have to demonstrate your ability to deliver. Yeah, we're, we're seeing more and more. I know, you know a, couple, a couple of data points. I know. Um, as we talk more and more with vendors, so that the side of the Wikibon business that talks with vendors, we're advising them more and more, if, you're, uh, if your customer it wants to use your technology, especially software, and they can't get it up and running in an hour, they're not getting something within an hour, uh, and, I, and I don't say that facetiously, um, they're probably going to kind of walk away from it. They don't have time to be having to figure those things out. We're seeing more and more um, software companies that are saying, look, you may eventually want to run this uh, on premises, right? You may have some reasons for running it behind the firewall, but initially we're going to give you a, a public cloud version of it. We're going to give you a SaaS version or something you can uh, get as a package from Amazon Web Services. So we're seeing that trend more and more. The other thing that you pointed out in terms of you know, the buying cycles, but who they trust, we're seeing more and more that they're looking to communities. They're looking to subject matter experts that aren't from the vendor. They're looking for some independents that say, I've tried this before, I've used it, I trust you more than I trust a, a, a vendor's you know, marketing data sheet. And they're going to that first, they're, they're uh, learning about it first, they're investigating, and then when they want to make that buying decision, then they're reaching out to that vendor. So it's really changing the buying decision. Couldn't agree with you more on that, Brian. And I think also um, another point just to reemphasize is if a requirement is if I decide today I would like to try your product tomorrow, I need to be able to do that. That is a requirement of the cloud. If you can't do that, then you're going to miss your opportunity because that enterprise buyer is going to move on to the next, right. ne next vendor. Right. Let's talk about segmenting the market. And Brian, you've done a lot of research in this area. One mm -hmm. of the findings of the, of the <coughs> result is research is that SaaS is overwhelmingly the, the biggest part of the market. It might surprise some people because we hear a lot about uh, Amazon and Microsoft and what's going on in the platform area, but these are really still relatively small parts of the overall cloud market, would you say? Yeah, I would, you know, you know, the numbers that you see up on the screen, you know, roughly 85 to 90 billion dollars. You know, we, we all sort of know that the IT industry as a whole is closer to two trillion. So um, it's still early days for cloud. People want to know which inning it is. Um, sometimes we'll say it's the first inning or the first inning of a double header. Um, there's definitely leaders that are emerging. I mean, in the IaaS space, uh, Amazon, Azure, uh, Google to an extent, IBM's making plays there. But SaaS is still really where uh, the bulk of the revenue is spent. Um, where I think people sometimes get surprised by that number is it's still somewhat fragmented. You know, a lot of people can pick the seven or eight or ten SaaS companies that they know off the top of their head. Maybe it's a WebEx or a Salesforce or something else, but there are hundreds and hundreds in that market. So huge opportunities for startups, but also huge opportunities uh, for just anybody in business who goes, boy, I wish there was a service that did this. You can typically find two, three, sometimes five or six that do something specifically for that. You can get, get to using it really quickly. And, and what that says to me is, is disintermediating the decision making from you know, IT centrally driving everything to, uh, to you know, the business being able to go, if I want to try and do something, I can go do it right now. I, I, again, couldn't agree with you more and I think that's in fact how companies like Salesforce 
uh, gut rolling or um, Expensify. You know, a, a salesperson decides, I'm going to start using this tool because it makes me more productive. I can decide today that I want to start using this application in the afternoon. And then once, you know, then they tell two friends and they tell two friends. And next thing you know, you then, the management team and f folks above start to understand how quickly they could roll it out across the organization. And then the benefits, the ROI on that solution gets pulled in. That's another very important driver in SaaS. Traditionally speaking, you would go license software, you would then you know, start to do all your testing, you do all your professional services and integration, and over time, you know, like in the days of deploying SAP, your time to ROI, your time to return on investment was elongated. In, in the world of SaaS, it's, you know, your, your, your payback period is very short. Yeah, I think and the numbers we saw were less than three months for SaaS and, and less than six months for PaaS. So uh, the, the, the acceleration on ROI is really, really fast. Jim, you, you work, obviously work with a lot of SaaS companies. Do you find that the SaaS business model is ultimately a more profitable, we know it's a more stable one, but is it ultimately a more profitable business model than traditional on-premise? Well, uh, over, over time, yes. So the SaaS model, um, when, if, you're, if you're starting a, a, a software company today, you're starting it in the cloud. You're starting it engineered for uh, SaaS delivery. And, uh, and that's a different business model. And so you're, when, you, when you're developing something that's enterprise grade, it requires investment to get it to that point. So you're in, in a SaaS world, you're investing ahead of the revenue returns over time. Many of you will recall, uh, there are several SaaS companies that are public today, and, and some of them, when they went public, they, they were not profitable. But over time, as their subscription revenues grow, you know, it's sort of, it's sort of invest once, run many. And although the, these, these organizations, many of which we're investors in, don't stop investing in R&D, but I'm saying the bulk of the upfront investment you, you then you start to harvest for that as more subscribers come on. <coughs> so your incremental you know costs are much less over time. And of course, they're taking a lot of uh, cost out of the out of the process as well, with yes. the, without the need for uh, expensive sales forces. Let's talk about some of the lesser known uh, cloud technology, specifically database as a service, platform as a service, and uh, software defined networking. This survey uh, did cover those as well. And Brian, can you give us some high level observations about what's growing what, what, uh, at what, what rate? Yeah, what, what this really told us from the survey respondents was, you know, what are the technologies that you expect to use in the next two years or you're beginning to use right now? So what we're seeing out of this is a couple of things. Um, you know, from a from from the the biggest one that that's growing there is, is platform as a service. I think what this is really telling us is we're seeing more and more companies, not just startups, but enterprise companies that are saying, I need to start building software to differentiate my business. Right? I need to start building applications uh, that are going to allow me as uh, the automotive industry to compete against Uber or Tesla. As uh, you know, if I'm in the agriculture industry, I want to be able to give more value to my uh, to the farmers, to the people that are you know supplying. Uh, food and so forth. So we're seeing more and more companies that are saying, uh, I'm going to own software, I'm going to own applications that differentiate myself. The other two that we're seeing, and, and these shouldn't come as any surprise, uh, database as a service, people looking to uh, spin up more data, more database as a service. And then the other one that was surprising, 23% uh, of the people said they're, they're really experimenting around SDN. So uh, we've all heard you know, around SDN, software-defined networking, um, VMware made a big acquisition there. Cisco obviously has a huge play. Uh, but what it really says is, and, and networking has always been a place that was slow to evolve, um, but we're seeing, we're seeing about a quarter of the people say, hey, um, you know, my environments are virtualized, my environments are becoming more, more uh, agile and more, um, you know, need more flexibility. Software-defined te uh, networking technology helps them in that space, and we're seeing uh, you know, those evolving technologies, not just the baseline storage compute and networking anymore. Jim, are you making some big, uh, some big bets in any of these areas right now? Uh, we do. We, we have, uh, we're investors in Couchbase. Um, we're also investors in Actifio, which is uh, s storage in the cloud. Um, so absolutely, we are. And Brian's points, I mean, it's, it's early days in some of it, database as a service, mm -hmm. early days, but, um, but we definitely see the trends. Uh, where the rubber meets the road is, of course, in, in how this stuff is all being used. And Brian, this is something you have followed in your research. You follow closely uh, <coughs> what different companies, how different industries are adopting a cloud. Uh, why don't you talk about uh, how it's being used in, in some of these new areas? Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, 
It's become a trend these days. If you go to any event, any conference, somebody's going to talk to you in the keynote about Uber. They're going to talk to you about Airbnb. They're going to talk to you about uh, you know, Tesla. But if you think about it, you know, cloud computing has really become pervasive in almost every net new product that we're seeing out there, physical products. So not just digital products anymore. Uh, you know, we show an example here uh, in the slide of Tesla. Uh, Tesla's a, a beautiful automobile, if you've ever had a chance to see one. Incredibly engineered, incredibly well thought out, but, but the thing that really differentiates it is how it integrates with the cloud, how it brings technology to the, to the car, so how it does communication within the vehicle, um, how you get entertainment. Uh, we just saw a couple of weeks ago, they pushed an over-the-air upload to the car that now gives you some form of sort of uh, you know, driverless driving or self-automated you know, automated driving. You think about that, we now have products that after you buy them, become more valuable, get more functionality. And we're seeing that, we're seeing that in automobiles, we're seeing that in manufacturing, we're seeing that in farming, almost every single industry. Yeah, I, and, and you've hit most of them, and I would just add one more, I'm just thinking of a, an experience I had personally just a couple of days ago with my new Fitbit, which I bought, and then to register and uh, sync it with my mobile app, I had to actually uh, register in the cloud. So they have all my information now, my vitals, they sync it with the actual device, and, uh, and th this is how these organizations are now uh, communicating. When you open the box and, you, and you, know, you, you activate, you're pushing all of it up in the cloud. I, the same thing just happened uh, a couple of days ago too with a refresh of the operating system on my TV. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and all the apps across were updated. And uh, your Fitbit actually updates now via your mobile app, via the cloud, uh, Internet of Things, right? The device yes, on your absolutely. wrist. Yes. Uh, let's talk about, uh, move on to, to IT's role. Uh, a lot of people think that the cloud is, will disintermediate IT, it will take, uh, take people to, uh, directly to the uh, services that they want to buy. Uh, I think this survey found that IT is actually beginning to reassert itself in the process. Uh, Brian, can you talk about the high points there? Yeah, I th there's a couple of pieces here. Um, you know, we, we talk about not only how much more IT is getting involved. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, there was lots of talk about shadow IT and the concern about shadow IT. I think more and more uh, IT is realizing, you know what, it's, it's get in or get out. Um, and, and they're, they're really kind of shifting it. Like the business is driving things. The business is saying, look, there are no more IT projects. Everything is a business project, but technology is a, a core underpinning of that. The big thing that we're seeing change is it's, it's less about kind of concern. And they're now saying, how do I become more agile? How do I help become part of this process to go quickly? Uh, I'll give you a, just a little you know, random, random nugget that we saw this year. Um, <clears throat> usually, if you would go to events and trade shows, um, they might show, you know, a vendor might bring a customer on stage and say, hey, what'd you do? Uh, they'll typically talk about, well, we, we implemented your technology, we saved 25%. Uh, but they don't typically talk about, uh, you know, radically changing their business. Uh, General Electric, who we know is from the industrial internet, they're trying to change their business. They were the keynote speaker at Cloud Foundry Summit, at Oracle Open World, at AWS, and a couple of other events. They essentially were out there saying, we need to use IT to change our business. They were actively recruiting developers. So IT is, is getting much, much more involved in wanting to be part of business decisions, not just you know, IT decisions. And one other point to add there too, when you talk about shadow IT for applications in the cloud, well, I, I don't think you'll rely less on IT. I actually think an example would be cybersecurity. As you put more in the cloud, uh, we have an investment in a company called Confer, which puts a sensor on, a lightweight sensor on endpoint devices, your mobile phone, your tablet, your desktop. And uh, it's becoming, as, as the consumerization of the enterprise evolves and those endpoints now are talking to these cloud apps or behind the firewall apps in the enterprise, IT is more and more involved to make sure that they are monitoring threats and Confer's solution, for instance, is uh, threat detection and behavioral analytics, and it becomes you know, more and more important. I think every other day, yeah. we hear about the latest cybersecurity breach. So as we shift to the cloud, there are new problems and new things that are created which IT needs to uh, uh, deal with. How does this affect the buying decision, though? I, it's very important to the, for the companies that you invest in to know who their customer is, and traditionally, IT has been the core customer. Is that changing? Um, y well, yes. I mean, I think, you know, uh, an example, um, a mobile banking application, cloud solution, a mobile app, uh, you log in and you're, you know, you're, you're accessing your vital personal financial information. And uh, oftentimes, 
uh, I think these financial institutions are getting better and better. If they recognize, uh, which just happened again recently, I logged into a financial institution from a different device. Well, it wanted to know if it was me. So they then sent a text to my mobile phone. I took that uh, five-digit code that came to my phone and had to enter it uh, on my laptop to get connected. And that's an example of the bank, the financial institution, is looking to respond to its customer set that wants mobile banking and mobile banking access, but yet has to partner with the IT organization to manage and monitor the threats that are ever present and exist today with bad actors who are looking to sort of get in the middle of that transaction and, you know, typically for malicious intentions. So <clears throat> the role of IT changes, but it doesn't become really any, any less important. No, I yeah, think, yeah, I no, think yeah. the role of IT changes and it becomes, you know, one could argue it's continuing to become more important. One of the interesting findings of the survey, uh, Brian, was that the motivations for people to adopt cloud <coughs> have changed somewhat over time. This is where this five-year horizon is really important. We can look back at, at the decision factors in 2011 and compare them to today. How, how uh, have they changed? Well, I think if we look back, you know, to 2011, we look back a couple of years ago, um, you know, scalability is still at the top of the list, whether it was four years ago or now. Uh, that really is, is saying, hey, I want to leverage public cloud resources in some cases where, you know, I don't have to buy them, I can use them on demand. But what's really changed is the second, third, and, and fourth order things that are driving it. Um, you know, in the past, people thought, well, if it's on demand, it's saving me money. Um, you know, maybe I, I'm driving a little more innovation. Really what's flipped is, because business is going faster, um, agility is, is a huge piece of it. People want to be able to respond to their lines of business and say, you've got a great business idea, great. How long is it going to take from idea to execution? So they want to compress that cycle. Cost is still a factor, it's becoming less and less because we're seeing transparency of the, of the cloud providers. People have a better sense of how to measure that. And, and what's interesting, uh, you know, we show innovation here as being the bottom of the, you know, that, 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 that four is the fourth one. I think what that really says is um, people don't think of technology as purely an innovation like it's magic anymore. I think they think of it as it's a core piece of business, just like if I've got expertise in financing, I've got expertise in marketing, expertise in technology has to be core, not sort of, you know, pure innovation. Uh, again, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, technology is a competitive weapon for the enterprise today, and it makes them more productive, more profitable, ultimately driving shareholder value. And uh, so I think, and that's going to continue to certainly be the case. And agility is important when these enterprises who are looking to innovate are trying to come out with a new app, whether it's an insurance app, a banking app, um, an e-commerce app. They're, they're trying to deliver solutions that they know their constituents want and need. Uh, and whether that's being an innovator or being responsive to competitive threats, and that agility component needs to be absolutely key in order to deliver these, these solutions in a rapid fashion. All companies are indeed software companies these days. Yes. Uh, I do want to touch, uh, Brian, on a, another data point in the survey, though. You mentioned that cloud, that cost has declined over time as a, as a driving factor in decision making, yet the survey found that the cost of cloud services is three times as likely to be a concern today as it was five years ago. Right. So there is growing concern over costs. Yeah, I think there is, and I think what that is, is it's coming from experience. As people uh, begin to use the cloud, uh, multiple types of clouds, whether it's SaaS or infrastructure as a service, they're beginning to understand not only um, how do I think about that, because I think a lot of times people used to say, well, if I'm paying by the hour and it's pennies versus a million dollar deal, you know, boy, I'm comparing apples and apples. Now they're understanding how to use reserved instances. They're learning how to be more sophisticated. So it's still there. Uh, they've got much more data points to, to go by, and in some cases, stories of success and failure and stuff. But I don't think, you know, we're seeing costs continue to come down, uh, but they're just becoming more sophisticated. They're becoming more aware. <clears throat> Moving on to data, one of the uh, the uh, points that the survey touched on that, that, that found some some unease was over data transportability, particularly as companies look to shift their resources seamlessly between uh, public, private, <laughs> and, and hybrid clouds. Um, what did you find regarding uh, the, the, the issues of data being on the move? Yeah, we, we saw some interesting things, and some of these feel a little bit uh, kind of counterintuitive, right? The, the natural thinking is, uh, you know, more and more data will move into the public cloud, it's more scalable, you've got very, very low cost storage prices especially. Uh, but what we saw, we saw 38% of the respondents said that they've actually moved data from a public cloud back into a private or hybrid environment. Um, we don't have the ability to get 
a, another level deeper in that. My suspicion is a lot of that is, um, you know, development organizations that have started in the public cloud, they've begun to learn more about their environments. They may have done it as shadow IT a couple of years ago, and, and IT is getting more actively involved in saying, hey, let me help, let me help bring some of that back in-house. In it may be secure, you know, something I've got to secure, become more compliant about. Um, the concerns about uh, data still very much consistent with what we'd expect. Privacy is still probably the number one concern. How much control I have over that, whether the providers are going to be in business. You know, we, we've seen some providers get in and out of the cloud. Um, and then the biggest thing that, that unfortunately we don't have any way to, to control is the speed of light and, and fixing physics. So people still struggle somewhat with moving very large amounts of data, although we are seeing some, some unique and creative things uh, from, the, from the vendors and the cloud providers about how to move more data uh, into the cloud um, and, and go from there. I should just touch on the, the issue of privacy being a, a driving factor in moving data back into private clouds. However, the biggest data breaches we've seen over the last couple of years have been I inside the firewall. Right, right, right. There have been no cases that I'm aware of of major breaches of public cloud. Well, and those are the ones that come out. I mean, we've seen some of the retail companies, some of the credit card things. I think what we've seen more and more is people are learning how to be secure in the cloud. They're learning, um, they're learning how to work co uh, cooperatively with their cloud provider. Uh, you know, we're seeing larger levels of encryption. People are feeling more comfortable there. I, I think that piece is coming down. I think what they're they're really trying to figure out that we see from a Wikibon perspective is, do I put more? Do I do I build applications that have data that originates in the cloud? or am I doing integration between what exists today in applications and, and new applications? And that really is the, the next architectural challenge that they're all trying to really master. This, uh, is, this is true, and, and one quick example, e-commerce, um, you know, huge market opportunity. You know, many of us have gone online and ordered something. You, know, you could go to nike.com or you know, pick your favorite place, Amazon, what have you, and order. Well, if something happens with that order, like it didn't show up, or it came in damaged, or you know, it wasn't actually what you ordered when you receive it. Well, the follow-up from there, when you end up speaking with someone at the organization, you know, where you, the retailer or the merchant where you purchased the good um, or service, uh, th those folks are then going to say, okay, what's your name? What's your address number? What was the account number? What was the, here's the order tracking number. And that is where they then go hit these disparate systems that we're talking about. And that data re resides all over the place. And it's very difficult to hit those legacy systems and bring those back and forth between public and private. And you're actually finding that some of the early inhibitors to cloud adoption from your 2011 survey are beginning to resurface when it comes to data transfer. Uh, why do you think that's happening? Well, my, my take would be it's, it's just the growth of cloud. So, you know, early 2011, there was a lot of experimentation. There was some, there was some FUD. There was some sort of, uh, you know, rumors and so forth of what was out there. Less people were, were actively using it. Uh, you heard some, you know, the news wanted to pick up on some bad stories. I think now we're seeing, you know, we've seen this growth. More and more people are just using the services. They're figuring it out. Um, and we've talked for a long time that the skills have to evolve as well. So there is, we've talked to a number of customers and they say, you know, it takes me three, six months to get used to the different learning curves, the different terminology. And I think that leads to a little bit of some of the difficulties. It's getting easier and easier to use it. People still have to, to kind of get over their learning curves and, and they're more actively using it, so. Uh, you mentioned user expectations earlier, uh, mm -hmm. Brian, and I want to return to that uh, of how this uh, affects the uh, the way companies are, uh, IT organizations are expected to deliver value to their users, as right. well as the speed with which companies deliver new products and services to the market. Right. Is cloud sort of fundamentally reshaping these expectation curves? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It's, you know, I always say, that the IT organization was always the one group where they've been the biggest laggard group. If you sit around uh, the, the C-level table, every other group says, look, if I've got things I've got to accomplish, and they've got to be accomplished in this quarter because I've got to report earnings to Wall Street, or I've got to you know, meet this six-month window, they go find out how to mix and match you know, what they own in-house and what they have expertise with, and what they go and sort of outsource or go you know, leverage a cloud for. IT is now starting to figure that out, and, and people want to, you know, the, the lines of business leaders uh, want to be able to say, I have an idea in this quarter, and I'd like to see at least an experiment of what that looks like in this same quarter. I don't want to wait two, three, four quarters to, to plan for that. 
Uh, Jim, you talked earlier about the uh, direct relationship with the cloud provider and how this may be disintermediating some of the channel. Um, how does the, uh, how, what are the, the ancillary effects of that? As companies want to deal more directly with their providers, how does that uh, uh, reshape the way services, the way uh, the companies you're investing in take their services to the market? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a good point, Paul, and I think it, it makes the whole process much more efficient. I, as the technology provider, have developed a, a, a service, a solution, and I know who my, uh, who my prospect or customer is. And on the other side of it, I, as a customer, if I decide I'm looking for a new uh, home banking application or CRM solution or data analytics platform or <coughs> you know marketing analytics platform, I know now that I can go out and take the, the requirements uh, uh, documents that I've gathered in-house, what do I need in my business, what do I need to build, how do I need to be responsive to the business and competitive pressures, and go map that to the various providers uh, in the marketplace, and that dialogue between providers and buyers is just much more efficient now in the cloud. And you know, before a buyer raises his hand and even you know, self-discovers and lets one of these um, uh, software pr uh, solution providers know that they're even in the market for the solution, they've done, s they're, so, they're so much more informed and ready to buy because they may have been on the website, they may have been to a webinar, they may have downloaded white papers, they may have done a more exhaustive competitive analysis than they could have done in the past. And so it takes so much friction out of the selling and buying process and it gets the two parties who are actually going to be talking direct, directly communicating. Does it also uh, permanently lower barriers to entry? I mean, are you seeing that your the companies that you fund are able to effectively challenge very large players uh, because SaaS removes some of those barriers? Uh, absolutely, I mean, you see it time and again. I mean, whether it's a Workday, or a NetSuite, or a Salesforce.com, or you know, one of the recent companies that just went public is Atlassian, and you can go on and on, and you see companies that were born in 2008 and 2009 who come out of the gates. Splunk is another example, Tableau another example, Marketo, um, and they build big multi-billion dollar franchises in relatively short order as compared to how long it took for an Oracle or a PeopleSoft or a Siebel Systems or you, know, you name it to grow to that same uh, level. And so it's, uh, um, it's a much more efficient way to go. And they are hugely disruptive to the legacy ecosystem. And, and it's why you see companies like IBM you know, really struggling uh, for growth. And because they get to this point where you know, the innovation side of their DNA, the, the DNA around innovation just doesn't exist in these big companies right. and it becomes harder and harder for them to compete. And the legacy, rather than being an asset, becomes a liability. Yes. Brian, uh, speak to uh, another finding <coughs> of the survey is that there is some, uh, uh, the companies are doing business with fewer providers in the cloud market yep. than in the on-premise market. Uh, what shifts does that pretend? Well, I, you know, so as we saw, you know, 75% of the respondents said that they're doing business with 10 or less vendors. Uh, it says a number of things. It, it says, um, you know, the, the large vendors, uh, and, and again, some of this is nuanced, but for the, for the main things they do, um, you know, the, the game is moving very quickly. The large uh, providers, whether that's a large vendor, somebody like an Oracle or a large provider like AWS, um, is, you know, people feel comfortable with them. Those companies in the past used to very much follow certain swim lanes. You were a database company, you were a network company, you were a, uh, an application company. They're beginning to come together. It's, we're seeing this happen in the marketplace, both you know, in the SaaS and cloud space, but we're seeing it on the vendor side as well. It's the reason that drove the EMC, you know, the Dell acquisition of EMC. It, it drove why Oracle was so adamant at Oracle Open World about having a huge cloud play. It's reshaping what Microsoft is doing and not talking about Windows as much anymore, but talking about Azure and, and Xbox. Um, you know, we're seeing this play out. The rules are very much changing. I like to say that you know, 2015 was the year that we really saw um, the game, the rules, being driven by the public cloud companies and everybody else in the ecosystem and the supply chain is having to respond to you know, how they're going to start to play by those new rules. So how do you see this playing out, Brian? Are we going to have, uh, is the market going to trend toward very large companies that offer everything, the Amazon Web Services model, or toward companies that are more specialized, uh, the Rackspace model, or both? Well, you know, I think that the answer to that question is, 
it always ebbs and flows. So we tend to see consolidation at times when, when there's a lot of, you know, when, when things begin to mature a little bit, we see consolidation. We're starting to see some of that today. And then as people, you know, as companies consolidate, um, they have to do a lot of integration to merge things together. Um, maybe the response time to customers doesn't happen as quickly. That's where you're always seeing opportunities for, for new companies, for startups, to go be very customer focused and deliver new things. So uh, right now we're, we're in a little bit of a, of a consolidation. We're starting to see some of the bigger players come together. Um, but by no means are we seeing any less activity and we're going to get into this you know, investment in people that want to be disruptive, that want to find new niches that are very specific and very profitable. We are going to get into that now and Jim, I'd like you to speak to the investment activity. We know it's been a crazy <clears throat> 18 months for uh, financing of startups now. Uh, some people will say, will say we're in a bubble, but certainly um, the, the bubble simply gets bigger. Um, what, is, what is driving all of these investments right now? Well, um, so first I'd say uh, we probably are in a little bit of an overheated market. Um, and, uh, you know, there no venture firm or growth equity firm that I know of is really investing in sort of perpetual or old school uh, technology models. It's, it's all SaaS and all cloud. Uh, so that trend is here to stay. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, the investment thesis is still, I think, the same as it's been you know, for, for a couple few decades, right? It's looking for companies that have come up with something that's innovative and disruptive, that has a solution that will help an enterprise be more profitable and more productive, where this technology can help become a competitive weapon and help them wring cost out of their enterprise. I think, you know, you talked about some of the old dogs, you know, folks like GE, GE is, you know, becoming a bigger player in Internet of Things as an example, mm -hmm. right? When you see a company like Nest come out with a device, come out of, you know, left field, create this business uh, and the enterprise value, and then have the kind of exit they did, and you think to yourself, how did a Honeywell or a GE or somebody like that, you know, not, you know, the companies that are supposed to be bring good things to life, <laughs> not come up with uh, this sort of technology? And, and so I think, um, you know, it's, uh, uh, we will continue to pour investment dollars into businesses like the ones I've been referencing that can come out with an innovative solution, uh, you know, pointed at a very large addressable market. And, uh, and, and these companies will continue to garner, you know, big war chests uh, because it's been proven, not all of them, right? The venture business, you know, half of them, Half of them win and half of them don't, and that's probably being generous. Only half. <laughs> ten percent is considered good. Yeah. Well, it? you know, uh, and uh, you know, if you make ten investments, you're really looking for two to re really be sort of your outsized um, returns, and, uh, and and so you know, there will continue to be spectacular investment opportunities uh, in the cloud, in SaaS, in platform as a service, in information as a service, in database as a service, and so it's here to stay. And I think the real art is finding the teams that have the know-how, the vision, have come up with a solution, architected something that is pointed at a big addressable market that will, ha that will literally show meaningful return on investment to the end user. I want to ask you about the economics of the, uh, of the sale to the customer. Now Microsoft has said that the subscription model is actually delivers twice as much revenue over I believe a five year period as the traditional package model. Is that what you're finding with the companies you fund? Um, yes, and, and I think, you know, I don't know, uh, I don't know the Xbox financials off the top of my head, but I think they're, they're you know, it's, it's clearly more than, and this is a substantial billion dollar plus business, and, you know, <coughs> it's a subscription business, and, y you know, um, they're finding that as somebody becomes more uh, um, addicted, if you will, or enchanted with Xbox, the more games they're going to buy, the more bandwidth they may buy, the more in-app purchases they may make. And, and so th that is the case. And um, it's the same in the enterprise. You may start off using a solution from you know, a NetSuite or a Workday or a Marketo and, and, or Splunk, or, and you're using X amount of functionality, but because you're seeing the return on investment, you then decide you're going to turn on this feature and you're going to turn on that feature, which is bringing the, you know, the subscription revenue per seat up. Right, so your, your, your mo money is flowing out a dollar at a time rather than $10,000 yes. at a time. Uh, Brian, any, any uh, comment on that, on how you see buying cycles and, and uh, uh, the corporate spending changing as a result of, of cloud? Yeah, I think, you know, 
a lot of people will talk about where, where budgets are. I think what we've seen is while IT budgets in a lot of cases are tending, sort of trending flat to you know, low single digits, business buying is, is, is growing. Um, and, and I think it becomes a, a more complicated thing to measure. So while you may spend more in just purely the license cost of something like that, you're not spending nearly as much in, in, uh, in power and electricity in your data center. Um, you're enabling your people to work on any device at any time. And you know, I think we're still going through a radical shift of getting used to the idea that um, you know, what, what can I do on a mobile device, which is you know, there's now three to five times as many mobile devices as there are laptop devices, and how does that drive productivity? And you know, the, the SaaS applications, the things that are cloudified that I can get to from any device, um, there's, there's productivity dollars that haven't yet been fully measured, but you know, that customers can look at that and go, even if I'm paying a little bit more over a long period of time, it wasn't a capital expenditure. I can align it to productivity, or I can align it to results better. And I think even from an accounting perspective, it becomes easier to say, measure opportunity, measure cost, measure results, as opposed to having to do it over five year periods with depreciation and all that other complexity. And I think if I could add one other point there, Brian, uh, you know, uh, the other piece of it is if you look at SaaS companies, you see much, much lower uh, professional services revenue component. And it's because the days of, of an SAP organization telling a, a very large you know, caterpillar, you need to wrap your business around my software application uh, and then hire us to go, you know, you'll spend $3 for every $1 in software license fees and 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you spent $3 in professional services to hammer that solution in. Today, you don't do that. Today, you decide, I want to start using this SaaS application and you, it doesn't require uh, this significant spend in professional services to integrate one of these solutions in. You can decide to start using it today and through an open set of APIs, integrate it in with your legacy applications and it becomes a much simpler uh, uh, way to implement and your, uh, your, your time to productivity is significantly shortened, which again, plays into ROI. Yep, the, uh, the latest Labor Department figures, I believe, show that productivity, office productivity in the U.S. has not risen at all in the last five years. And I'm wondering if this is because we're going through a, a change, a, a cyclical change, where we're learning to adopt these new technologies. Are we, are, are we on the, the, uh, uh, the, the threshold of an explosion in productivity as cloud really makes its, its impact felt, Brian? Um, I, I think that may not be necessarily the right area to focus on. I think you know, in the office productivity, that worker, while they provide a valuable function for the business, the investment is around driving the things that, that touch the customer more so, not, you know, get me through a meeting more efficiently or get me through batch processing. It's how do I help a customer be more informed about my product? How do I help them understand, uh, you know, things that could impact their thing? That's where the investment's really being made, and I think that'll be the metric more so in this, uh, in this phase of the industry that we'll start to measure. You know, measure time to make a buying decision, time to, or even just trying to measure the intelligence of the, bi or, uh, of the customers as opposed to productivity of users, which, you know, it's a, it's a cog in the business, but it's maybe not the thing that drives revenue. So maybe the stuff we're measuring is not all that valid well, anymore. Well, and I think it's shifted. I think, you know, IT used to be focused on productivity of the business. IT is, is shifting to become, uh, you know, we heard it in, in a talk yesterday, business technology, not information technology anymore. And uh, Wikibon has written extensively about the, the transition from uh, systems of record, record to yes. systems of intelligence. And this is a big shift for IT as well. Absolutely. Uh, how do you see cloud enabling this IT shift to, to bring more value to the business? Well, th the simplest way to think about it is what cloud enables at its scale and the pace at which you can do things, um, it, it, the systems of intelligence, systems of engagement, they're all about data. They're all about you know, experimenting with data, being able to take large, large data sets and be able to do analytics on top of those. The cloud's a perfect platform for that because I can, I can experiment, use things for a month, or I can store massive amounts of data that maybe I didn't economically, I couldn't economically do in my data center previously. So those types of systems, incredibly data intensive, but very, uh, you know, as, as Jim was saying, API driven. I want to interact with multiple systems. Doing that in the public cloud is much easier than having to sort of orchestrate it within, you know, behind your firewall and all the security concerns of that. Uh, Jim, I wonder how you're evaluating uh, companies these days. We're sort of moving into the uh, second generation of SaaS, you could say. I mean, SaaS as a concept is about a decade old now. Are you seeing the types of companies that are coming to you seeking funding, are they changing? Are the types of, of uh, value they're bringing to the market changing? 
Absolutely, and and you know you can go sort of industry by industry and continue to find uh, really innovative uh, SaaS solution providers. Uh, one that we're um, investors in is a company called eRecruit, which is basically a uh, a SaaS based solution uh, for the staffing industry, and it literally helps you from in you know if you're a large organization and you happen to be uh, a, a healthcare provider, and you're looking for orderlies and nurses and visiting nurses, and, and you want to staff up for these folks. It's difficult in today's uh, employment environment to find those people, so uh, source them, interview them, onboard them, validate their <coughs> credentials, make sure that there's a handoff between your payroll provider and, and, and have that uh, all in the cloud. We've, we've invested in a company called eRecruit that basically took what was a, a whole bunch of manual processes, phone calls, emails, disparate uh, uh, things going on, and brought it all to the cloud so that everybody who's in that life cycle of, from inception, I have a requisition, I need to hire a human being to join my organization, to you know, welcome to your first day in our, new, in our enterprise. There's a lot that happens in and between there, and here's an example of a cloud-based solution, a SaaS solution, that, that bring, drives so much productivity in, in that process because there are so many people involved, um, whether the HR department, the hiring manager, the, uh, the benefits and administration folks, the payroll provider, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, interestingly, the survey found that uh, HR has moved from one of the lowest cloud adopters in 2011 to, I think, third on the list this year. So we're receiving, seeing new functions actually derive value from the cloud that, uh, that they didn't see before. Absolutely. Uh, Brian, any thoughts about loyalty? Uh, th this survey showed that companies want to do business with fewer vendors in mm -hmm. the cloud than, than they did on-premise, but Theoretically, switching costs should also be lower, or it should be easier to switch. Uh, do you see any trends in, in loyalty to cloud providers being different than, than to more traditional companies? Uh, you know, I, I think we're going to see, th there'll be a certain amount of that. People feel comfortable, because we have to remember, switching cost, while there's a, the cost of the actual switching, the bigger cost is retraining people, having to redefine processes, all those types of things. So, um, you know, I don't know that people have ever felt you know, incredibly loyal to their vendor. I think when their vendor, whether it was a vendor or a cloud provider, took good care of them, they were, a, they were a good customer, there was a good customer vendor relationship, those things worked out very well. I think that's going to continue to be the metric. How well do you take care of my business? The difference being, you know, there's, there's competition uh, amongst the SaaS providers. We're seeing a lot of competition in the platform as a service space. Um, but, but the metric of switching is still complicated. It, you know, switching's not easy. What it becomes is, uh, let's let's find those companies that are good, uh, that are easy to work with. Um, you know, th some of those metrics are going to change. How easy is it to, for for me as the vendor to do business with you? How easy do I make it for you? Um, because that switching is getting somewhat simpler. And and I would say um, uh, one example, leaving some of the names. Uh, 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 I, I won't mention some of them. I'll leave some of them out. But we're uh, investors in WP Engine, which is a leading WordPress hosting and content management platform. And it has it had huge growth over the last three years, significant growth. And we've had a couple of providers in the cloud that have not been able to keep pace with our growth. And so we've had some switching costs uh, and, and gone through a little bit of pain, ultimately to get to a very good place. But uh, these cloud service providers need to be able to keep pace with, uh, with their partners and, and make sure that they, uh, they have uh, the requisite resources and, and scalability and, and uptime and SLA, service level agreements, you know, to be able to uh, deliver. And, that, and that's going to happen. I mean, the, the, the less your business, like you said, you're not investing in businesses that are doing, you know, uh, year-long ELAs and, and perpetual licenses. As the, some of those licensing models go away, they become more on demand. Uh, the, the vendor doesn't have the ability to be, you know, to just build lock-in strategies. They've got to build strategies about really trying to satisfy their customers. Do you see, a, a question for you, Jim, about how this market evolves, and a little bit of crystal ball gazing here. Do you see this market actually proliferating? Uh, five years from now, will there be many more SaaS providers, or will we actually see some, some, uh, uh, some consolidation, uh, the, the winners sort of consolidate their positions? Sure. I mean, I think the natural laws of consolidation will continue to occur. So some of the big legacy enterprise companies out there that are, 
um, you know, natural acquirers of high growth SaaS businesses will continue to take, take some of these companies out uh, from an M&A perspective. So you'll see folks like IBM and Oracle and, and others continue to make acquisitions. But I think at, you know, at the bottom of the pyramid, you'll also see uh, the, a significant flow of new startups uh, that are all cloud and SaaS based that are coming to market with something new and innovative. So, you know, my crystal ball would say, I'm certainly bullish on continued innovation. I'm certainly bullish on, you know, uh, there'll, there'll certainly be big winners who will disrupt <coughs> through that innovation process some pretty significant markets. We hope to be there uh, as investors in, in some of these companies. But I think, uh, you know, um, the velocity is going to continue to increase in all of these segments that we've been discussing. Yeah. Brian, this is a time of year, of course, when a lot of predictions are made, and you're the smartest cloud guy I know. Um, <laughs> what do you think is coming in the next year? Well, I think we're, we're in for, like I said early on, I think 2015 was the, the year, the tipping year, where the rules kind of got changed. Um, I think we're going to begin to see companies uh, make major investments, whether those are, are the established 10 or 12 you know, largest vendors that are out there making big changes in, in not just their technology, but really changing how they go to market. Um, you know, Chuck Robbins, who's the, now the new CEO of Cisco, uh, every one of his quarterly earnings, the, the biggest thing he's talking about is recurring revenue and software. You never would have heard that from Cisco three years ago, five years ago, uh, but that's top of mind. You heard Larry Ellison talking about SaaS and cloud at Oracle Open World. Uh, I think this is going to be the year where we're really seeing, uh, from, a, from a large vendor perspective, um, them having to radically change their, their business models um, to, to align better to this, this competitive situation. Uh, Jim, same question to you. What's coming in the next year? Well, and uh, you know, uh, one thing I'll, uh, to add on to that point, one of the things about the SaaS business model that, that's fantastic is this recurring revenue, we like to refer to, I like to refer to it as the, the gift that keeps on giving. In the old perpetual model, you were always sort of swinging from the monkey bars. Is the company going to make the quarter? Did they sell enough you know, uh, perpetual licenses? Is the growth still there? With, with a SaaS subscription business, you can smooth it out, and you know you have a backlog of customers, you have subscription, you have revenue, you know what your expense line is, and it's a, it's a much more uh, intuitive and easy way to sort of manage your business. And uh, so, Paul, I guess, you know, um, last view of the crystal ball, I mean, we're, uh, we'll be closing on another investment here soon, I hope, uh, um, in the, uh, another SaaS uh, uh, solution provider, all cloud-based, and, um, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the opportunity for us to deploy more capital in each of these segments is going to continue, as I said earlier, the velocity is going to continue to increase, and, uh, and I think the future is bright. You know, uh, you know, four or five years ago, I, I don't know that anybody would have predicted the kind of growth uh, that, that this market has, has seen in each of these segments. And um, I don't think it's stopping anytime soon. We certainly hope it doesn't stop anytime soon because uh, that, uh, the cra no one's looking forward to a crash. Uh, thank you both, uh, gentlemen. Uh, Jim Moran. Brian Gr Gracely uh, from Wikibon for fielding a terrific survey, uh, one that provides a lot of new insight uh, on where the market is going. If you want to get a copy of the <coughs> survey, you can find it uh, on SlideShare. You simply have to, uh, uh, the easiest way is to follow our Twitter handle, um, at Future of Cloud on Twitter. Follow hashtag Future of Cloud, or simply search for the Future of Cloud uh, survey uh, by Northbridge. You will find the 64-slide uh, presentation on uh, SlideShare that goes into considerable detail on the results uh, of the study. We certainly hope you'll be doing it again next year. Uh, so, thanks again to Jim and to Brian, and uh, for Wiki, for uh, Silicon Angle Wikibon. This is Paul Gillen saying thanks to thank you for joining us. Uh, we will see you again soon, and have a great holiday season. <laughs>